So this is the title. I think you all know this fellow. Uh, iconic scientist of the 20th century. And for many people, the fellow on the right is equally iconic as the sage of the 20th century. Uh, 1879, 1950, Urbana Maharshi, South India. Uh, Carl Jung described him as the whitest spot in a white space. Um, he made BBC. Uh, Henri Couture Bresson took the last pictures of him as he was dying. Uh, Margaret Bork White did pieces on him for Life Magazine, back when Life Magazine really mattered. Uh, and more contemporaneously, I was at a conference at, in La Jolla a few years ago, and Eckhart Tolle, I'm sure you all heard of, was giving a talk. And there is, a, in that particular setting, you walk up three steps before you go to the place where you sit and talk. And Eckhart started to walk up the stairs. And on the podium was a banner with Mata Maharshi's picture. Because they like him, too. And Eckhart just stopped and turned towards him on his picture and bowed. So uh, many, many people know about him. If you haven't come across him, strongly recommend you check him out. YouTube videos, great websites, all kinds of stuff if you want to get there. So these two guys uh, said interesting things about this. Mata Maharshi, you can read this. You're all good readers, I'm sure. Uh, really came down to is everything predetermined, not just the big stuff, but how about the little stuff, like moving this glass of water to the back of this table? He said, everything is predetermined, no caveats. Um, this other fellow, the fellow who got the funny hair, uh, said something very similar, surprisingly perhaps to many people that he would have said this, but there it is. Um, Everything is determined, beginning as well as the end, over forces of which we have no control. Not just folks, vegetables, cosmic dust, insects, yada, yada, yada. A surprising statement from one of the premier scientists of the 20th century. He also added something that may be helpful, that you can will what you want. I'm going to move this glass. But you can't will what you will. I mean, the backdrop within which the context emerges to do that action is out of your control. And what this will be is a uh, kind of a journey through looking at questions like, can physics somehow explain consciousness? You need Wigner, who's a big, big fan of his, also a Nobel laureate, contemporaneous with Einstein, um, said, physics can't even prove physics, <laughs> let alone prove anything else. <laughs> He also said that it wasn't possible to formulate the laws of quantum mechanics, physics, without reference to consciousness, to an earlier discussion we had two talks ago. And in a kind of a non-technical piece entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, uh, he pointed out that the possibility that we are so successful at formulating mathematical solutions, if you're mathematicians in the room, you don't think it's easy, that we can find such clever explanations for physical phenomena is because they are all a self-contained extant entity, self-consistent. Because of that, he said, you had to somehow incorporate us and consciousness into the equation. So what we're going to do is look at what can be deduced from all of this about free will, choice, karma, etc., uh, outcomes of all of our actions. And is this scientifically reasonable? Those of you who know quantum mechanics know there's a seminal experiment. There's a seat down front here if you want a seat. There's seats down here if you want to sit. You okay? Sure. Uh, Benjamin Libet, this is kind of like the double slit experiment for uh, free will. And Libet at UCSF in 1983 did some interesting work that's been replicated many times. Uh, folk just put a watched the clock, noted exactly when they moved their wrist. They also noted when the intention to movement, when they actually knew they were going to move their wrist. And the intention to move, not surprisingly, happened 200 milliseconds before the movement actually occurred. OK? So far, so good. Now it gets complicated. They put electrodes over top of the motor cortex so they could actually watch when the brain began initiating the action. And also, 
monitored the muscle activity to know exactly when motion took place. Now what came out of this was a very surprising conclusion. The brain actually started to activate, initiate the movement 500 milliseconds before the action began, well before you even knew it was going to happen. You only knew it was going to happen 200 milliseconds before it actually happened. So it was already in the mix, it was already going towards progression when it was like, by the way, we're going to move this wrist. What this looks like schematically, I think you've all probably all grasped when you look, is that the brain initiates movement, we become aware of the impending action, and action occurs. Not the other way around. One then might well ask, what role do we play in those actions? In fact, it's already been somehow subconsciously, unconsciously mixed up and is in progression. The question has been raised by many folks, many thoughtful folks. It's been heavily studied, discussed in the literature and other places about what about those 200 milliseconds? We have to do something. What if we decide, oh, stop, do not move the wrist. Uh, do we have free will in that interval? Can we exercise some free will to maybe stop that? Strassen uh, takes one approach here, which is that at birth, uh, we're really constructed pretty heavily by genetics, pretty well learning and environment. More about that later. And, though, and then after that, throughout the course of our lives, anything else that we do come across is already set in place <coughs> by the construct, the paradigm within which we experience reality our genes, where we were born, when we were born, our parents, our environment really headed us toward being able to experience that particular moment a cer certain way. You try to change yourself, you're also constructed by the same paradigm. I can't decide this afternoon to be a professional football player. No matter how much I might want to be one, I can't become one. And this time to veto, this 200 milliseconds, he used the example of his bottom, used this no more free will there than there is for an egg on a griddle deciding whether or not it's going to fry. 